So here we are again, backed by unpopular and somewhat idealistic demand. I've been trying to get to this song for a little while. I got vaguely uh, somewhat interrupted during the Halloween period by doing a little thing for my daughter, Gemma. But this was the song I've been looking to do. Um, and in a weird way, follows on from Witch Hunt in a way, as I find myself becoming uh, more and more driven by trying to speak what is for me the truth, which is, after all, the modus operandi of this channel. I'm not here to um, mine likes. I'm not here to confirm biases. I'm here to speak the truth as I see it. And, and this song is, in that respect, very important to me. I first became aware of Gil Scott Heron through Greg Proops uh, and his um, podcast, um, the Proopcast. Now, you might know Greg Proops from um, Whose Line Is It Anyway? He's a comedian. He's an improv artist. He's funny and smart and erudite and goes as the smartest man on, in the world. That's it, the name of his podcast, Smartest Man in the World. And, and when he first started that podcast, he spent an awful lot of time talking about the Romans an awful lot of time talking about baseball and quite a bit of time talking about various aspects of culture. And one of them was this artist, Gil Scott Heron, who I wasn't familiar with. I'd heard of one of his songs before Proops uh, hipped me to him, and that was The Revolution Will Not Be Televised. And I'd heard of that because, I mean, how could I not? What a well, an amazing title. It's something that's been used in various ways in the media for years. But I wasn't really aware of Gil Scott Heron. I wasn't really aware of his place in the Parthenon of what has become rap and hip hop. I wasn't really aware of him as a performer, as a lyricist, as a singer, until Greg Proops talked about a song called Whitey's on the Moon. And it's a very simple song and it's a great lyric. And maybe at some stage I'll feature that as well. But Proops pointed out that, you know, uh, Whitey's on the Moon was written to talk about the moon landings. And if you if you replaced Whitey's on the Moon with Whitey's in Iraq, the point that that song was making about the willingness of Western society to spend money on matters of, let's say, defence, and matters of, let's say, ego and their unwillingness to spend spend money on matters of social fairness and health care and social care. If you swap the moon for in Iraq, the point that Gil Scott Heron made with that song remains absolutely valid. And 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 he opened up a little rabbit hole for me. And one of the other songs he talked briefly about and the song that I came to very, very passionately buy into, whose, whose message and whose point I completely and utterly bought into, was this song, Work for Peace, which is a song that Gil Scott Heron wrote in 1994, I think the album was released. Um, 1994 being, what, three years after the first Gulf War. First, the, the first Gulf War, the, the, the Iraqis invaded um, Kuwait in 90, and in January of 1991, the air war started, a war that we all got to watch on television. This was not a revolution being televised, but it was a war being televised. And, and it has that war itself has some specific memories for me because for one of the few times in my life I was painfully unemployed. My wife was painfully unemployed. The workload for a, a brief moment really, really dipped down to the point that we were struggling to pay the bills. And I remember at that point, we ended up with our bed in the living room of our rented house with the television in the corner, literally watching night after night, waiting for the bombs to start falling because the war was being televised. It was astonishing. It was it was the making of CNN. It was another one of those moments where, in hindsight, definitely you realise that you are watching the world change before your eyes. 9-11 was a bit more obvious in that moment. But looking back at, at 1991, looking back at that first Gulf War, you can trace so much of where we are now back to that moment. And certainly 
Gil Scott Heron had something to say about it, something important to say about it. And and I completely buy what he has to say. And I want to add my voice, my small, humble voice to his as we take a look at, at this fantastic song, um, Work for Peace. Back when Eisenhower was the president, golf courses is where most of his time was spent. So I never really listened to what the president said because in general, I believed that the general was politically dead. But he always seemed to know when the muscles were about to be flexed. Because I remember him saying something, mumbling something about a military industrial complex. Americans no longer fight to keep their shores safe just to keep the jobs going in the arms-making workplace. And then they pretend to be gripped by some sort of political reflex. But all they're doing is paying dues to the military-industrial complex. The military and the monetary. The military and the monetary. The military and the monetary. The military and the monetary get together whenever they think it's necessary. They turn our brothers and sisters into mercenaries. They are turning the planet to a cemetery. What a voice, firstly, what a voice. And what a simple, what a simple vibe, what a simple tune. But, I mean, he could not, Gil could not lay out his agenda more plainly than in this opening, these opening bars. And you, and you might wonder, when he's writing a song in 94, that's so specifically inspired by the Iraq war. Why has he gone back to Eisenhower? Correct me if I'm wrong, answers on a postcard, but I think Eisenhower was the 50s. But we've gone back to Eisenhower, and the reason is very simple. It was Eisenhower that said, you know, that, that, that identified the military-industrial complex. It was Eisenhower, the general, the war president, who identified the military-industrial complex as being part of the problem. So what is that? Very simply, war is money. War, huh, what is it good for? Money. War is great for money. War is great for profit lines. War is great for innovation. War is great for quick advances in technology. But mostly, war is fantastic for money. And Eisenhower identified it, and that's why Gil Scott Heron starts this song at Eisenhower. And then he jumps to this, Americans no longer fight to keep their shores safe. And when he says Americans, he can just as easily be talking about the British and the Australians and all of the sort of nations that lead these charges into these foreign adventures, these military industrial adventures. No longer fight to keep their shores safe just to keep the jobs going in the arms making workplace. I mean, I can barely say it the way he says it, but he's, you know, this idea that they we pretend that it's about polit politics, pretend to be gripped by some sort of political reflex, but all we're really doing is paying our dues to the complex. He lays out his, his, his bill of wares here absolutely and emphatically. And, and unfortunately, let's be perfectly honest, after we've seen the, the events of the last few months, uh, a 20-year occupation of, of Afghanistan, 20 years, the occupation of Afghanistan. Um, I want to say 20 years. What are we in now? 20, 2021. Yeah. Yeah. Two years of the Bush presidency, that's eight. Two years of the Obama presidency, that's 16. Four years of the Trump presidency, that's 20. 20 years in Afghanistan, for what? The beneficiaries of Afghanistan were the military-industrial complex, were those, those millionaires and billionaires just sucking at the tit, sucking at the tit of, of the military-industrial complex. And the losers, well, they were the homeless veterans and the traumatised soldiers. And let's be perfectly honest, the hundreds of thousands of lives lost to everything from 
illegal and mistaken drone hits to battles on remote hillsides that ultimately met, meant nothing. Gill knew what he was talking about, and, and he was talking about it in 94. And he, he goes back to Eisenhower in the 50s, and we jump forward to 2021, and it's just as relevant today as it was when he first wrote these words and, and spake them in this voice, this astonishing voice. And let's not forget this line. They turn our brothers and sisters into mercenaries and they're turning the planet into a cemetery. Yeah. Blood on the sand, blood in the hills, blood on the streets, homeless veterans. Jimmy Carr got into trouble for telling a joke. He said, say what you will about the war in Afghanistan and Iraq, but England's going to have a fantastic para Paralympic team. And people lost their mind because they thought he was mocking the soldiers who had lost their limbs. But actually he was punching at the governments that sent them there to do that. He was punching at the people that so cheerfully turn our brothers and sisters into mercenaries and the planet into a cemetery. The military and the monetary get together whenever they think it's necessary. They turn our brothers and sisters into mercenaries. They are turning the planet to a cemetery. The military and the monetary use the media as intermediaries. They are determined to keep the citizens secondary. They make so many decisions that are arbitrary. We're marching behind the commander-in-chief who was standing under a spotlight shaking like a leaf. The ship of state had landed on an economic reef, so we knew he was going to bring us messages of grief. And wow. <laughs> wow. Again, 1994. He's talking about Bush the Senior, not even Bush the Junior. He's talking about Bush the Senior standing under a spotlight, shaking like a leaf, with the ship of state on an economic reef. Messages of grief. I mean, he turns such cynical political realities into such fantastic bars. But he speaks the truth. He speaks the truth. And now he's about to talk. I mean, we were shielded by January. You remember? Desert Shield was the first stage of what became Desert Storm in February. First was the air war. Then was a hundred hours of war. And in all of that, the, the media as intermediaries, decisions that are arbitrary, and the citizens secondary. He was right then, in hindsight, more and more. And he, he is still right now. And as we saw... Hundreds of people desperately trying to escape Afghanistan. People that we had made commitments to. People that had worked with us and served with us and protected us. Being left behind. Young men falling and dying from the undercarriages of planes. I wonder what Gil would have written about that. I wonder what Gil would have said about that. Do you think it would have sounded so very different to this? Because it's just the military and the monetary. Power and money. Determined to keep the citizens secondary. They make so many decisions that are arbitrary. We're marching behind the commander-in-chief who was standing under a spotlight shaking like a leaf. But the ship of state had landed on an economic reef. So we knew he was going to bring us messages of grief. The military and the monetary were shielded by January and was storming into February. Brought us pot-bellied generals as luminaries. Two weeks ago, I hadn't heard the some bitch, now all of a sudden, it's legendary. They took the honor from the honorary. They took the dignity from the dignitaries. They took the secrets from the secretary, but they left the bitch, an obituary. The military and the monetary from thousands of miles away in a Saudi Arabian sanctuary had us all scrambling for our dictionaries because we couldn't understand the fucking vocabulary. 
Man, this man speaks the truth and he speaks words that I can completely hear. What a line. They took the secrets from the secretary, but they left the bitch in obituary. Yeah. The military and the monetary from thousands of miles away in a Saudi Arabian sanctuary had us all scrambling for our dictionaries because we couldn't understand the fucking vocabulary. Yeah, there were some smart bombs, but there were some dumb ones as well. Scared the hell out of CNN in that Baghdad hotel. The military and the monetary, they get together whenever they think it's necessary. War in the desert sometimes sure is scary, but they beamed out the war to all their subsidiaries, tried to make it so damn insane a worthy adversary, keeping the citizens secondary, scaring old folks into coronaries. The military and the monetary from thousands of miles in the Saudi Arabian sanctuary kept us all wondering if all of this was really truly necessary. <laughs> I... I, I, I'm not entirely sure what the demographic is of my audience. Audience, my audience. How ridiculous is that? The, the, the few hundred people that might watch this or portions of this. I'm fairly sure a lot of you remember this time. I'm sure a lot of you remember the specific reference to CNN journalists in, in a Baghdad hotel. The, the reference to Saddam Hussein as so damn insane, tried to make him a worthy adversary. I remember Bill Hicks saying um, they spent a lot of time telling us that the Iraqi army was the fourth largest army in the world, world, the fourth largest army in the world. But after three, there's a mighty big drop off. They spent a lot of time selling us this enemy. They spent a lot of time and money selling him the weapons that they then bombed into the Stone, Stone Age. <laughs> They spent a lot of time supporting him as he fought their enemy. Saddam Hussein had form in the Middle East, fighting against Iran, who the Americans had made an enemy by, and the Americans and the British had made an enemy, when they um, tried to control the country so much that they ended up flipping it to a radical uh, religious government, a religion that they didn't agree with. Not their radical religious government, not my radical religious government. One we didn't agree with. So suddenly Saddam for a while was our ally and we sold him lots of stuff and then we went and bombed the crap out of it. And Saddam Hussein was not a good man. Saddam Hussein was a very bad man. But this was a war that they chose to fight and chose to let him wage. <laughs> military and the monetary from thousands of miles in the Saudi Arabian sanctuary kept us all wondering if all of this was really truly necessary. We've got to work for peace. Peace ain't coming this way. If we only work for peace, if everyone believed in peace the way they say they do, we'd, we'd have peace. The only thing wrong with peace is that you can't make no money from it. Did you get that? For all of my ranting and raving about the politics of the Gulf War and the politics of Afghanistan and Iraq and all the other political and military folly, follies in my lifetime and the lifetimes that went before me, this is why this song is important. Because Gil doesn't just rage against the dying of the light. Gil posits an alternative. If everyone believed in peace the way they say they do, we'd have peace. The only thing wrong with peace is that you can't make no money from it. You've got to work for peace. You've got to work for peace like we work for the military industrial complex. If we did that, imagine what we could be. We've got to work for peace. Peace ain't coming this way. If we only work for peace, if everyone believed in peace the way they say they do, we'd we have peace. The only thing wrong with peace is that you can't make no money from it. The military and the monetary, they get together whenever they think it's necessary. They've turned our brothers and sisters into mercenaries. They are turning the planet into a cemetery. We've got to work for peace. Peace ain't coming this way. We should not allow ourselves to be misled by talk of entering a time of peace. Peace is not the absence of war, it is the absence of the rumors of war and the threats of war and the preparation for war. 
The lyric is incorrectly re rendered here. The line is astonishing. Peace is not the absence of war. It is the absence of the rumours of war and the threats of war and the preparation for war. Peace is not the absence of war. It is the time when we are all when we all bring ourselves closer to each other, closer to building a structure that is unique within ourselves because we have finally come to peace within ourselves. Listen to this man carefully, because Gil speaks the truth. We should not allow ourselves to be misled by talk of entering a time of peace. Peace is not the absence of war, it is the absence of the room of the war and the threats of war and the preparation for war. Peace is not the absence of war, it is a time when we will all bring ourselves closer to each other, closer to building a structure that is unique within ourselves because we have finally come to peace within ourselves. Military and the monetary. Military and the monetary. Military and the monetary. Get together whenever they think it's necessary. They have turned our brothers and sisters into mercenaries. They are turning parts of the planet into a cemetery. What you gonna do? Military and the monetary. Military and the monetary. What you gonna do? We hounded the Ayatollah religiously, bombed Libya and killed Gaddafi's son hideously. We turned our back on our allies, the Panamanians, and saw Ali North selling guns to the Iranians. Watch Gorbachev slaughtering the Lithuanians. We better warn the Amish, they may bomb the Pennsylvanians. Oh man, in a rendering of all these incredible monstrosities done in our name. What a line. We better warn the Amish they may bomb the Pennsylvanians. As the Panamanians and saw Ali North selling guns to the Iranians. Watch Gorbachev slaughtering the Lithuanians. We better warn the Amish they may bomb the Pennsylvanians. The military and the monetary. Get together whenever they think it's necessary. They have turned our brothers and sisters into mercenaries. They are turning the planet into a cemetery. Listen to that voice. Groove, man. I don't want to let him preach, but I mean, the beautiful simplicity of that. There are thousands of children all over the world need your help. And they talk about 55 cents a day and 70 cents a day. And that number hasn't changed that much. At the start of COVID, we were busy collecting for people in South Africa that were knocking on a friend of mine's door looking for food. And it was astonishing how far the money could go on just keeping people alive and feeding them. Money being gathered from people, just ordinary people. While they're talking about building hypermissiles and starting a new Cold War and a new arms race. And they're going to find trillions of dollars to do that. And here in the UK, they're going to find billions of pounds to buy new replacements for Polaris and submarines to put them in. You know what that is? That's old men 
buying their sports cars to replace their flaccid penises. That's what that is. And that money could be working for peace. It could be feeding kids. And I also don't want to sound like a late night commercial or a late night preacher. But man, if anyone at all is listening, then it's worth saying we got to work for peace. I'm 55 cents a day and 70 cents a day. I know a lot of folks feel as though that's, 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 not, that's not really any kind of contribution to make, but we have to give up a dollar and a half just to get in the subway nowadays. So this is a song about tomorrow and about how tomorrow can be better. If we all, each one, reach one, each one try to teach one. Nobody can do everything, but everybody can do something. Everyone must play a part. Everyone got to go to work. I'm going to let him finish, but I'm going to repeat that because I can. Nobody can do everything, but everybody can do something. Everyone must play a part. Everyone got to go to work. Work for peace. Possibly the most important song that's ever been on this channel. About tomorrow and about how tomorrow can be better if we all, each one, reach one, each one try to teach one. Nobody can do everything, but everybody can do something. Everyone must play a part. Everyone got to go to work. Work for peace. They, they say that he's a godfather of rap music. They say that he's a beat poet. That's, they say that he was one of the forerunners of what became the rap movement, the hip hop movement. I don't know about that. I'm not qualified to say. But I do know he had an awful lot to say and he was, why is that auto playing? Uh, that'll teach me, you see, I shifted. The guilty secret I shifted to Edge because Chrome is just sucking so hard. The uh, This is a hell of a man. And right there, Gil Scott Hair and Work for Peace Live 2001. I'd love to have shown you that one because it's an amazing version. And I'm going to put a link to it in the bottom. But this is the complete version of the album with the complete lyric. And the complete lyric is a masterpiece. The complete lyric is a gospel. The gospel according to Gil. And I'm a subscriber to that gospel. And I hope I've convinced you to at least think about it. Nobody can do everything, but everybody can do something. Everyone must play a part. Go to work. Work for peace. I cannot think of a more suitable message for an aging rockers <laughs> music reaction channel, uh, AKA the gospel according to Paul and Gill. Thanks for watching. Hope to see you again until then. Work for peace and keep the faith. <laughs>